Good evening. Uh, welcome to everyone here this evening. My name is Troy Osborne. I am the Dean at Conrad Grable University College. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2022 Benjamin Eby Lecture. Uh, I think this is the 36th in a series of lectures that offers Grable faculty the opportunity to share their ideas with the wider community, uh, making accessible the fruit of their research and hopefully inspiring each other towards a larger vision of the life of mind and the spirit. The Eby Lecture is named after Benjamin Eby, uh, an early bishop and educator in the Mennonite community of Upper Canada in the 1800s. It was Eby and a few people of similar stature in the community who set the course of life in Waterloo County in the first half of the 19th century. So it's with Eby's work at supporting education, literacy, singing, and theology in mind that this series is named. Uh, E.B. promoted education among the, the group that descended from the Mennonites from Pennsylvania who purchased 60,000 acres of land, Block 2 of the Haldeman Tract, in 1805. The college, I'd like to acknowledge at this time that the college and the University of Waterloo is built on the traditional territory of the Arawandaran, Neutral, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land was given in treaty in 1784 to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. And as we work on building relationships with our indigenous friends and neighbors, we at Grable are educating ourselves continuously and working to change our understanding of the narrative of our place. As Kate and I noted when we first planned this date, this is American Thanksgiving. And so I will begin today with some thanks, notes of thanks at the beginning. Begin with acknowledging and expressing my gratitude for the, uh, from the financial support from Jim and Golding Pankratz who have helped to make this lecture series uh, possible. Jim was Dean of Conrad Grable from 2006 to 2014 and interim president from 2016 and 17. Those of us who worked with Jim are still grateful for his support and for faculty teaching and research and the many, many ways he strengthened Grable's academic programs. Those of us who began our careers here with, when Jim was Dean remember the warm hospitality with which Jim and Goldine welcomed us. So now we continue to thank him for supporting academics at Grable. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, my, my, the assistant to the dean, Birgit Mashinsky, uh, to, who helped kind of put all the behind the scenes pieces of this together, to Nathan on the cans back there, I think that's the sound crew name for it, uh, for the communications department for recording this, which will be put online uh, a little bit later, and also a special thanks to Daniel Cabena and Lily Gutierrez for their contributions to tonight's uh, lecture. And Kate has said that you should, if you're thinking of questions to ask, you should also think of questions for Daniel and Lily on their, uh, on their sense of working with the material tonight. So uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Kate Steiner. I seem to be missing a page here. Oh, my pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's lecturer, Kate Kennedy Steiner, Assistant Professor of Music at Grable. Kate's research into medieval music combines an analysis of music, ritual practice, narrative history, and communal identity, and I believe we're going to get a sense of all of those this evening, uh, tonight. So it's kind of, kind of a nice uh, introduction to Kate's work. She received an MAR in liturgical studies at Yale Divinity School and a PhD at Princeton University with her dissertation on music and liturgy in medieval St. Andrews. Before coming to Grable, Kate held postdoc positions at Valparaiso University and the Pontifical Institute for Medieval Studies. At Grable, Kate teaches a range of courses stretching from medieval music to the music of Lin-Manuel Miranda. So it's quite a uh, repertoire there, Kate. Uh, she also directs the chapel choir and directs the church and music and worship program. I am especially grateful to you, Kate, for the many ways that you build bridges between Grable's academic and residence communities and between the college and our broader community. In many ways, Kate works is an expression of Grable's mission of serving church and society. Kate is a gifted scholar and teacher, and we're very happy to have her as a colleague this evening. So at this point, we'll welcome uh, Kate Steiner. Kate Kennedy. Thank you, Troy, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Today, the Cathedral of St. Andrews stands in ruins on the eastern coast of Scotland giving you a little arrow there to show you where that is. But when the cathedral was finally completed and dedicated in 1318, 
It was one of the largest cathedrals in the British Isles. Completing the cathedral was an enormous task begun over 150 years earlier in 1160 and delayed when a storm destroyed the West End in 1272. And so the day of dedication of the cathedral in 1318 was considered a great accomplishment and gift to the dedicatee, St. Andrew, the Apostle of Christ. On the day of dedication of the cathedral, we are told in a later historical account, King Robert the Bruce and all the king no key nobles of Scotland joined the bishop and clergy in processions and songs to praise St. Andrew. We are not told what they sang, but the songs likely included liturgical chants and songs about Andrew, Andrew's main claims to sanctity, his calling as one of Jesus's original apostles and his later martyrdom on a cross. Among the music that marked this festive occasion, this chant was likely included, perhaps in this uniquely ornamented form from St. Andrew's in a style after the Cathedral of Paris. of St. Andrews in 1318 was a notable state of and church celebration. King Robert the Bruce, who was infamous for being involved in the murder of his competitor to the throne in 1306, had successfully led the Scottish kingdom to victory against the English at the Battle of Bannockburn just four years earlier in 1314, a turning point in what are called the Scottish Wars of Independence. The dedication of St. Andrew's Cathedral was finally an opportunity for Robert the Bruce and all nobles of Scotland to show St. Andrew gratitude for his aid at the Battle of Bannockburn. According to a friend of Robert the Bruce, whose account was recorded over a hundred years later by the historian Walter Bower, St. Andrew was one of three saints whose aid Robert the Bruce invoked as he headed into battle. Surprisingly absent in this list is St. Columba, who uh, founded Iona, which is marked in black here, with the arrow in black. Sorry, my arrows got a little bit off there. The Irish abbot, Columba was the Irish abbot who founded Iona Abbey on the Western Isle of Scotland and was credited with converting early kings of Scotland in Bede's authoritative ecclesiastical history of the English people. St. Columba's banner, and possibly also his relics, housed in the center of Scottish, the Scottish Kingdom, which is where the blue arrow is there, were traditionally processed in battles of Scottish kings in the period before 1200. But Robert the Bruce makes no mention of St. Columba's help in fighting the English in 1314. By then, Andrew the Apostle had superseded St. Columba and other homegrown saints in the loyalty of King Robert the Bruce and his followers. And Andrew's care for Scotland is still symbolized in the Scottish flag today. How is it that Andrew, an original apostle of Christ, who died in Greece around 60 CE, according to apocryphal accounts, and whose relics were moved to Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul, in 357 CE, according to the histories of Constantinople, and whose life and death were far removed in time and place from what was called the far north of, of Europe in Scotland, 
How did Andrew come to be understood as actively protecting Scottish kings and teaching the Scots as one late medieval song began? A few written accounts of the journey of Andrew's relics to Scotland and his intervention for Scots in, the battles, in battles survive. But in the liturgy of St. Andrew's Cathedral, sung yearly at his festival on November 30, and in smaller memorials throughout the year, the story of Andrew as a saint, an imitator of Christ, and a martyr came alive. The story of Andrew's ascendance to be national patron begins in the, the 1120s, but the story of his liturgical celebration in St. Andrew's concentrates on the period between 1202 and 1238. A single liturgical book from St. Andrew's, and indeed from all of Scotland, survives from this period, but this book tells a great deal about how the liturgy for St. Andrew shaped his Scottish cult in this period culminating with the dedica dedication of the cathedral in 1318. It also tells us a great deal about the bishop who commissioned the liturgical book, Bishop Malvesin, bishop between 1202 and 1238. Remarkably, this same bishop also commissioned new music for St. Andrew in the musical style sung in Paris we just heard. The performance of this music further links the celebration of this ancient saint with the community of clergy at St. Andrews in the 1230s. The ritual of singing, uh, the ritual singing of story, scripture, and prayer that made up the liturgy of the celebration of the Feast of St. Andrew was the glue that bound together an ancient Eastern saint and a small kingdom in the far north of Europe. In the liturgy, Andrew was transported from the distant past into the here and now. More than simply storytelling, singing the cherished devotional words spoken by Andrew put flesh on Andrew's bones and a tooth that resided in the cathedral as they sang. As the introduction to medieval cantors and their craft by Bugish, Fassler, and Crabel states, the liturgy made time constantly spiral backward, rendering past sacred events present through ritual commemoration. I begin tonight by examining the historical context of the liturgical celebration of St. Andrew in this period between 1202 and 1238 pointing to the particular concerns and interests of the Bishop of St. Andrews that frame the creation of his liturgical books. I then examine how ritual commemoration makes the past present, first by way of another song practice, perhaps more familiar to some here, the songs and accompanying stories of Anabaptist martyrs. And then I examine how the music of the ritual commemoration made the historical Apostle Andrew a present reality. Finally, I will consider how music and liturgy at St. Andrews provided the foundation for a unified, independent Scotland. The desire for Scottish independence, though Scots now will again vote in another referendum in 2023 on their independence, the idea is by no means new. Scotland, as a kingdom, was ruled in 1200 by William the Lion, one of a line of Scottish kings stretching back to the mid-11th century. Many of these Scottish kings intermarried with Normans and Anglo-Normans, including William himself. Therefore, ties were strong and complex between the Scottish aristocracy, uh, aristocracy and clergy they placed in power and their Norman king in both England and France. Yet Scottish kings like William the Lion and his successors were in an ongoing dispute with the kings of England over whether they owed fealty to the English realm. In other words, it, whether they uh, should be in submission to the English kings. These disputes carried, uh, uh, these disputes over authority and submission extended to the bishops of Scotland who were like their kings, according to some English kings, bound to submit to the Church of England. 
But the bishops of Scotland, especially St. Andrews, claimed to have authority independent from any archbishop, especially the Archbishop of York, just south of the border. In 1192, and then again in 1215 and 1218, the Pope confirmed that the churches of Scotland were a special daughter to Rome, and therefore none had authority over them but the Pope himself. Bishop William Malvesin was instrumental in maintaining this status for the Scottish Church and seeking recognition of the primacy that bishops of, the, of St. Andrews had long claimed as the head of the Scottish Church. And here I've given you an image of Bishop Malvesin's seal um, on which it states, this is the seal of William, by gra God's grace, Bishop of the Scots meaning not just Bishop of St. Andrews, but of the whole Scottish church. Malvesin was likely, very likely born in northern France, and he cultivated family connections there and scattered throughout England, Ireland, and Scotland. Before being Bishop of St. Andrews, he was Chancellor to King William, and he seems to have kept that position even after becoming Bishop, being instrumental in negotiations on behalf of the king. In other words, though by no means homegrown himself, Mavisan's political career was dedicated to validating and protecting the idea of a Scottish people ruled by their own king and their own church and none other. The Gothic Cathedral of St. Andrews begun in 1160 and the liturgical music introduced by Bishop William Mavisan for the cathedral were part of his efforts to validate and protect this Scottish identity. Under Bishop Malvesin, the Gothic cathedral was partially completed, enough that it could house the precious relics of St. Andrew, and host the liturgical celebrations of the new community of French clerics hired by Malvesin, largely through family relations. But these clerics had no liturgy, or if there was a liturgy in place at the old cathedral, it was not fit for this new Gothic cathedral. Mavesan's work during his long tenure of 36 years as bishop to complete the choir portion of the cathedral, to establish a liturgy for that cathedral, and to acquire music from Paris for that liturgy would feed the connection between St. Andrew the Apostle and the Scots. Two legends explained Andrew's special mission to the Scottish people, one composed around 1120 and the other sometime in the 1200s. These legends, found in historical accounts, sermon collections, and collections of other saint stories, tell the story of an ancient battle between the Scots and the English in which St. Andrew intervened to defeat the English king and his army. St. Andrew then sealed his patronage of the kings of Scotland by sending his relics to the land of St. Andrews where they remained. Although these relics do not seem to have circulated much outside of St. Andrews itself, by the 1200s, it is clear, the late 1200s, it is clear that Andrew was a key symbol of Scottish identity and independence for King Robert the Bruce, his court, and the Scottish barons who sealed what has sometimes been called the Scottish Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320. The liturgy practiced under Malvesin made St. Andrew the symbol of their shared Scottish identity. And this is the subject of a larger book project I'm currently working on. I want to pause briefly from this study of medieval Scotland to consider how singing about the past, particularly about people who are understood to actually still exist in eternity, works. The concept that songs make past people and events present and alive might be more familiar to some of you from the songs of Anabaptist martyrs. As some of you know, the early years of the Anabaptist movement in the mid-1500s, in, in those years, stories of imprisonment and execution of those committed to adult believers' baptism circulated among Cladenstein Anabaptist communities in the Low Countries, Germany, and Switzerland. Some of these were published as early as 1562 in a compilation of stories with 25 songs about or by the martyrs. 
Some of these songs were even reportedly sung during the moment of torture or death. One example of a martyr song is a text now included in the new Mennonite hymnal, Voices Together. Everlasting God, sorry, this shouldn't have gone blue. Everlasting God is a set a text attributed to the martyr Anneline of Freiburg in the 1600, or sorry, 1660 and 1685 edition of the Martyr's Mirror, a collection of stories of Anabaptist imprisonment and martyrdom, shared and read in Anabaptist communities for hundreds of years. In the story of Anna or Annaline, and here I've uh, given you an image from one of the copies that we have in our archives, thanks uh, to Lorraine Harder, Harder's help on that, um, getting this image. This story we are told, um, in this story we are told, this Anna of Freiburg was zealous in the fear of the Lord, and as she believed, sorry, and as she believed in Christ and was baptized upon faith in him and thus sought to arise with Christ and walk in newness of life, she suffering many torments, sentenced to death and drowned in the water and afterwards burned with fire. When she was about to die, she spoke the following prayer to God. Thereupon she, finally, she voluntarily submitted to death and was drowned in the water. Sorry, it has a mind of its own today. These last words of Anna, here provided in the song version that was reworked for the story version in Martyr's Mirror, provided a model for those who studied her, but singing them also preserved her memory, making her alive and present to people who never knew her, because she in fact was still alive, though not in earthly form. Aaron Lambert has examined the role that singing these songs in early Anabaptist communities played in reinforcing the idea of resurrection, that the martyrs lived on in eternity. Lambert writes, as much as martyrological texts preserved the words and actions of those who died for their faith, they also hold traces of the acts of singing, listening, and reading that preserved their memory. Lambert traces the action of singing the martyr's song through legal records of individuals arrested for carrying their songs and thus admitting to singing them. And she concludes that singing the songs themselves was a means of participating in the death and resurrection that their subjects, the martyrs, had already experienced. She writes, voices raised in song ensured that the stories of those who had long since risen from the dead long indeed before their bodies were burned to ash, remained forever alive. When early Anabaptists sang the songs of martyrs, they instructed each other in the faith, but even more so participated in the martyr stories through singing. Singing these martyr songs in the context of their sacred stories was an act of memorializing akin to anamnesis in the liturgical sense. Anamnesis is typically associated in liturgical studies with the memorial of Jesus' Last Supper during the Eucharistic prayer of the Mass. Mass excuse me. This memorial in the pre-modern Western liturgy was not a recitation of the Last Supper that happened in the distant past, but a reenactment of it here and now, making the gathered community participants in the salvific events celebrated. Although this idea of anamnesis is most clearly distilled in the Last Supper, the whole medieval liturgy, predicated as it was on reenactment of key events that point towards the cosmic story, was also a way of participating in the salvific events remembered in sacred song. Similarly, Memorializing the Anabaptist martyrs in story and song made those who sang participants in their resurrection. The work of memorializing in the medieval liturgy, bringing into the present a past event, was done through a more formal and complex structure of story, song, and action. But the effect of making the past present was similar to those of the Anabaptist martyr songs. 
This was especially true in the long night prayer service called Matins, in which stories of Jesus and the saints were sung and read alongside prayers and psalm singing typically, that were typical of daily prayer services. It is in this context that St. Andrew the Apostle's story was recounted everywhere across Western Europe on November 30 every year and will still be in, seven, in six days. But in the Cathedral of St. Andrews, the clergy celebrated St. Andrew with all of the liturgical splendor and rank available, a full set of proper chants and readings for his feast day, and on the octave of his feast day a week later, and chants to be sung every day in between. They also sang his name twice in every lit litany of saints sung at other large feasts and dedications of churches. Most of the chants of his feast at St. Andrews were commonly sung in the British Isles, as far as we can tell from slightly later sources. But at St. Andrews, they recognized, sorry, they reorganized the chants, added a unique chant text, and embellished the office with polyphony in the style of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Two aspects of Andrew's story that shaped Scottish identity were his calling as one of the first disciples and his role as teacher, even in his persecution and martyrdom. St. Andrew's claim to be one of the first uh, disciples, along with his brother Peter, lay behind the rather exaggerated claim found at the end of the first legend of St. Andrew's relics in Scotland written around 1120 or 1130. Peter was the founder of the Patriarch of Rome uh, and the head of the entire Western Church. And so the legend concludes that on account of Peter's brother Andrew's relics in Scotland, the city of St. Andrew's is Rome after the first. This is the special city of refuge. This is the city of cities of Scotland. Ian Campbell has argued that the cathedral and the city of St. Andrews were designed in the 1100s to replicate the design of old St. Peter's and the Vatican Borgo in Rome. And here I've given you um, red arrows that point towards the streets that are, um, according to Ian Campbell, mimicking the Vatican Borgo. Andrew's kinship with the founder of Rome laid the foundation of his cathedral and city. Furthermore, St. Andrew himself taught the saints the Christian faith. In 1299, so near the end of the 1200s, Pope Boniface attempted to settle the war between the King of England and the King of Scotland by stating that Scotland should be independent because it was Andrew the Apostle who converted the kingdom to Christianity, and the presence of his relics in St. Andrew's Cathedral was testimony to that ancient history. And over 100 years later, we are told in a fundraising letter of the prior of St. Andrews around 1400s that Andrew is the tutor of all Scots in particular and special patron concerning whose care and tutelage it is sung, Andrea Tudor Scotiae, Andre Andrew, teacher of the Scots. Unfortunately, this particular chant doesn't survive like most of the liturgical books from St. Andrews but the prior's discussion of it indicates that the chant was well established at the cathedral and known elsewhere. Both of these sides of Andrew, his rank as first called disciple and his role as teacher, even during his death, was developed, were developed in liturgical chants and readings sung at St. Andrew's every year. The textual sources for the liturgy for the feast of St. Andrew the Apostle present St. Andrew as the first called disciple and teacher in his martyrdom. The gospel accounts of Andrew, though very minimal, signaled two important aspects of Andrew, that he was one of the first followers of Jesus and that he was brother of Simon Peter. The key passages from the gospels relate, relating to Andrew Matthew 4, 18 and Mark 1, 16 testify to these two important claims. In the John account, in fact, it is Andrew who first recognizes Jesus 
as the Messiah and brings Simon Peter to Jesus. And it is here with the simple yet loaded statement that Andrew, one of the two who followed the Lord, was also the brother of Simon Peter, that the entire celebration of St. Andrew begins, here shown in the liturgical book commissioned by Bishop Malvaisin. Each of the chant examples and translations that follow here, I've adapted from an edition of St. Andrew's office in a different Scottish liturgical book by Knott and Hare. The account from the parallel gospels, Matthew and Mark, closes the opening evening celebration with a chant narrating the mystery of discipleship through the simple story of Andrew. The chant opens with the scene setting. The first phrase, Ambulans Jesus Juxta Mari Galilee, begins on the home note D, here, and follows the typical melodic formulas for mode one, outlining ascents up to A, here, and returning to the D, either from C below or from E above. But it sets up Jesus' words by ending on C here, which contrasts the home note, leading us to into expectant into the words of Jesus' call, venite post me, come follow me, which answers the most the more unusual form from E to G, a, a leap that we haven't heard so far. The melodic climax of the entire chant here is on Andrew's response, relectis retibus, he left his nets. The words relectis retibus echo in other chants in the liturgy, signaling the denial of worldly possessions. biblical account of Andrew recited in this opening office of Andrew's feast, and it is introduced dramatically, setting apart the voice of Jesus from the response of Andrew, the main subject of the night liturgy that follows. Apocryphal accounts of Andrew's missionary activities supply the rest of the story of Andrew's life and his character as preacher and teacher. Here I draw from the work of Ritva Jakobson on the textual sources of the office of Andrew. Censored reworkings of a heretical text, an ancient heretical text, the Acts of Andrew supplied the readings for St. Andrew's liturgy with a narrative of a debate between Andrew and his executioner on the meaning of the cross and martyrdom and supplied the chants of the long night liturgy with Andrew's devotional acclamations to the cross as he approached and hung on his cross. These 
last words of Andrew, sung in the chants that set Andrew's journey to his cross, discipled singers through participation. Each of the antiphon chants of the office set Andrew's own words with more direct musical language in contrast to the narrative that frames them. In three successive antiphon chants in the middle of the long night liturgy, we hear Andrew address the cross three times. These antiphon chants proceed in descending modal order, meaning that they begin in a more joyful, expansive mode, but shift to a more somber and intimate mode. The first of these is in the unstable mode three, which ends on E here and avoids emphasizing the B above E because that would lead to an ugly tritone. But at the moment of Andrew's first address to the cross after seeing the cross from afar, the singers repeat Andrew's own words to the cross for the first time with a remarkable ascent up through the B to C and even higher to E. So here's the um, section where Andrew hails the cross the first time and the ascent through the B. The next antiphon chant similarly sets apart Andrew's pious acclamation of the cross with an ascending line outlining mode two with a full cadence. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here I've highlighted here. The final of the three antiphon ch chants ends with the acclamation and a similar ascent to and cadence, marking and tying Andrew's three acclamations of the cross together. And here's the final acclamation at the end of this chant.
These three antiphon chants are followed by three readings of the debate between Andrew and his executioner on sacrifice and communion, punctuated by chants that hail Andrew as the good teacher, framing this debate as Andrew's teaching moment for those observing the liturgy. After this, Andrew hung on the cross for two days, and as the reading describes, he continued to comfort the minds of the believers. Finally, in a dazzling light, he passed into eternity. It is in the chance that the liturgy allowed those gathered to participate in Andrew's passing declaration. In the final antiphon chant of the night office, the culmination and the ecstatic moment in the night office, time between Andrew's martyrdom hundreds of years earlier and the clergy of St. Andrew's collapsed as they sang Andrew's final words, now I see, now I adore, now I stand. The threefold repetition of the word now emphasizes the liturgical concept of hic et nunc, the idea that medieval liturgy was a way of experiencing and participating in the past, here and now. After this moment of transition for Andrew, the night office shifts to speak of Andrew in the third person. The chant responses to the sermon reading on Andrew by Gregory the Great speak of him as that man who appeared most meek among his people. It is at this culmination of the long night liturgy that the most remarkable music was sung at St. Andrews. A book of music now held at a, the library in Wolfenbüttel, Germany, was made in St. Andrews for the cathedral clergy around 1230. Most of the contents of this book are copies of two, three, and four-part settings of chants that were produced at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, and were said to be made by two clerics working there, Leonin and Perotin. This copy of the Notre Dame music was made under the patronage of Bishop Malvesin, the same bishop who commissioned the liturgical book to provide an updated liturgy for his clergy at St. Andrew's Cathedral. In other words, this bishop was particularly concerned that the liturgy and music of St. Andrew's Cathedral reflect the practices at the biggest and best endowed cathedrals of England and France, especially when it came to celebrating St. Andrew. Copied amongst the music from Notre Dame Cathedral is a setting of two responsory chants for St. Andrew made specifically for performance at St. Andrews. These would have adorned the opening and closing celebration of his feast with the most recent trends in musical style, of which you heard a snippet at the opening. The musical style, called organum, maintains a chant melody on the bottom while allowing an expert singer to add longer phrases in between each note of the chant. While the singers must always cadence on a fifth or an octave, the only allowed consonances at the time, the soloist adding their part might sing any number of embellishments in between. But the really distinguishing feature of this music of Notre Dame style is the use of rhythmic patterns that interspersed longer free-flowing phrases. The effect further elevated particular words and phrases in the chant, but also stretched and rhythmicized time. These regular shifts between measured and unmeasured time in the chant and two-part settings throughout the liturgy are self-referential, drawing attention to music's own ability to render time, regularly reminding the participants that music is the means through the which the past 
and the present are experienced and contemplated. Here I've displayed for you just the soloist sections of this chant that were set to two parts in the St. Andrew's music manuscript. There is a long section of chant sung by the entire choir after these two opening words, that man, vir iste. So you can tell that already this is a much longer and more elaborate type of chant than those we have considered so far. But the two-part setting would stretch it even out even further. And at this point, I invite you to help us in singing this chant. This is the audience participation moment. I'll ask you to sing the first three notes of this chant. And I'll give you a motion when you're to move from one note to the next. So we'll all sing. And when I motion you, you'll move down to. And then we'll move back up to. Those are the three notes you need to know. Can we try it one moment? So. Gusto too. Um, you'll you'll be hanging on to this note for a while, so take a breath when you need to. There's plenty of people to support the sound. <laughs> just begun on this section, and Daniel has had plenty of opportunity to explore the melodic possibilities between <coughs> these two Fs. This section expands these first two words in unmeasured time, but it goes on to move in regular rhythm, a marked influence of Paris. This shift between long elaboration and fast rhythmic regular rhythm can also be heard in the other unique two-part setting for the Andrew chant in the St. Andrew's music book. The inclusion of this chant in both liturgical books commissioned by Bishop Malvesin shows his intervention. Nowhere else in Europe was this chant sung at the opening of the Feast of St. Andrew. The chant itself has a rhythm of its own, a sign of more recent composition. But at St. Andrew's it also appealed because it addressed Andrew directly as guide and requested Andrew's help. In the two-part setting of the first two words, vir perfecte again are drawn out along with imitator of the soloist's first section. The next phrase of Jesus in, the, in this verse section, which is the soloist section, then shifts to measured rhythm, though the composer struggled to give the phrase a longer arc. The last line, however, achieves phrasing because the St. Andrews composer actually changed the chant slightly so that it has one note per syllable and neatly hops around in thirds. The, trans the chant transcription I've made here is directly from this two-part version. These shifts between different temporal divisions in music must have provided rich variety in the musical display of the partially completed cathedral in Bishop Malvesin's time, pointing to the musical framework of time in the liturgy.
This two-part setting copied into a book held at the Cathedral of St. Andrews elevated the celebration of the patron saint of St. Andrews by imitating the prized music from Notre Dame in Paris. It is this music that joined the devotional expression of the clergy with their embodied experience of Andrew in the liturgy, framing as it did the opening of the celebration and culminating in the long night office. When William Malvesin was promoted to Bishop of St. Andrews in 1202, he assumed the title of his predecessors, Bishop of the Scots. But in 1202, it wasn't entirely clear who the Scots were. He had hired mostly his own clergymen through his French family's connections, but other clergy working in the Cathedral of St. Andrews were drawn from northern English priories or perhaps adopted from regional older Scottish communities. In other words, the Scots were by no means a unified group. Yet in the years following England's loss of Normandy to Philip Augustus of France, the kings and nobles of Scotland needed to further forge a united Scottish identity that would maintain their independence from England and their alliance with the kings of France. The Andrew Apostle, more than the local saints, provided a familiar and universally revered model of sanctity and divine assistance. Andrew's patronage over Scotland towered visually in the Gothic cathedral on the east end of the kingdom. His feast was celebrated with local fairs and the legend of his divine appointment to Scotland written in books. But it was in the liturgical celebration that Andrew was remembered as their founder and teacher. Singing of his first calling with Simon Peter reinforced their own claims to be a divinely appointed people. Singing Andrew's last words both provided these, those present in the liturgy a model of devotion to the cross and allowed them to participate through song in that devotion. And in adopting the musical style of Paris, St. Andrew's Community Cathedral emulated the most important cathedral in the French kingdom. These ritualized experiences of Andrew affirmed his patronage of Scotland as original disciple and preacher, making it possible for the earls and barons of Scotland to write in the letter of, 13, of 1320 in defense of Robert the Bruce and their claim to independence from England, affirming their divine charter in their divine charter, nor did Jesus Christ wish the, the Scots to be confirmed in that faith by merely anyone but by the first of his apostles, the first by calling, those second or third by rank, the most gentle St. Andrew, the blessed Peter's brother, and desired him to keep them under his protection as their patron forever. The liturgical language they use to describe Andrew as most mild belies the real source of their shared identity in St. Andrew. It was in songs of the liturgy framing and animating Andrew's story that the Scots met the apostle Andrew. The ritual complex of story and song embodied the ancient past in the present moment. Song's ability to transport the past into the present isn't uniquely confined to this particular ritual complex. For those who believe that the past is not entirely lost to us, songs of the past become portals collapsing the distance between the ancient past and the here and now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate, uh, for transporting us to Scotland. And thank you to Daniel and Elaine Madigan. Another round of applause. Just for <laughs> Before we uh, celebrate this uh, lecture with the reception down in the atrium, uh, we do have some time for some questions. If you have questions you'd like to ask Kate or to the, to the singers this evening. Because sometimes it's good to be Dean. Uh, oh, there's Alicia, thank you. Um, so 
No, and what they use, um, so I don't know of any, well, first of all, very, very little survives um, that was from Scotland at all. Um, and the Acts of Andrew were really kind of distilled, censored, reworked into a version by Gregory of Tours around the seventh century, I believe, um, uh, called the Passio of St. Andrew. And that's really what circulates. It's not the directly the Acts of Andrew. Um, but uh, I do know there's a book from Northern England, the, the York region, that's a, um, a full legendary, so a, a collection of all of the saint stories, and that would hold um, those texts that would be used for Andrew. And it also holds, that particular one also holds the story of Andrew's relics going to Scotland as well. So um, that text in its distilled form from Gregory of Tours certainly circulated all over Europe. You made reference to uh, the Cathedral of St. Paris, Notre Dame, Notre Dame. Um, so how did the music get to Scotland? Was it too traditional? Yeah. You brought that and then adapted it to the, the, the Scottish people. But weren't they, the Scottish people, did they not speak, they didn't speak French, did they? Well, so this is where the Scottish people breaks down um, because we, he brought it. So we have, we have records of Malvesan traveling regularly to France to visit family. Um, he's, he's also kind of a networker. He likes to make sure that he, he um, checks in on all the like, big name bishops while he's on the continent. Um, and so it's likely that that's when he picked up this music, um, though uh, he also employed within his own cathedral several clerics who had educations and French names, and that really points very strongly to them being educated in Paris. So in fact, the cathedral is mostly run by these clerics who are French, who've gotten French educations, um, though they're kind of mixing in with people who uh, might have a longer Scottish history. Uh, it's a real mix at this point. Um, so uh, it seems likely that Malvesan encountered it on one of his trips to France, as well as perhaps a cleric that he brought with him, a clergy person that he brought with him. And it's that clergy person who, who actually copied the music into this book and then added his own pieces. These Andrew ones are his own pieces. There's also a few at the back that are his own pieces. but. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of both this copy and then he, he sticks in his own works right in the middle to make them look like they belong in this Parisian book. Uh, are these uh, uh, perhaps missed this, but is the music uh, actually from Vienna and Perpet, uh, or is it just copies of or trans of who knows type thing where it, it morphs into what we heard tonight, which is beautiful by the way, and a lovely presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, the, the music that we heard tonight is written by this scribe who's in St. Andrews, who's employed by Mave Sam. He's writing in the style that's supposed to be Leonin and Peritine. But we actually, I mentioned Leonin and Peritine because like if you, if you were paying attention when the Cathedral of Notre Dame was burning um, in, what was it, 2020? Um, People talked about the long history of music in that cathedral, and Leonin and Peritin were brought up a few times. So you might know those names um, from, from that occasion. Um, but, but how involved they were in making these copies of music is really unclear. The copies that we have are actually from much after when they lived. Um, we learn their names from a couple spurious, well, a couple kind of much later sources that it's, it's hard to tell how accurate they were about how much Leon and Peritin had a role in this music. But nonetheless, the scribe in St. Andrews is really trying to make it look like this music comes from Paris, too. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kate. Uh, very, very interesting. I'm interested in um, like reception and participation. So mm -hmm. who is participating in these liturgies, or like, is there a congregation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no lay people are singing. 
in these liturgies. They are in the cathedral, which means that they're public. And because it's St. Andrew's festival, surely there were several lay people. It was expected kind of that, that the city would go. But we don't have an account of you know, how many people would be there, etc. So who's singing is really the community of clerics themselves. And, and they're also um, in this period, especially in Mount Vincent's period, kind of in their own enclosed area as well. They're, they're their own community, though you can join and listen around in the cathedral. And once that's finished, of course, it would be an incredible acoustic where you really could hear um, outside of them as well. But yeah, uh, apart from the clergy who are doing it, the participation is through hearing. Yeah, well, um, St. Andrews claims to be the head of all of Scotland. Um, it is where one of the royal palaces lies. Um, but it, it's also kind of the, the most important position that you can get as a clergy person. Um, and so it, it ends up being um, a way of dispersing because uh, people who end up having important positions elsewhere have always had an opportunity to be at a clergy person at St. Andrews first. And so that's kind of how it gets spread through church networks across Scotland. Um, apart from that, it's not entirely clear. The evidence that we have is that you know, by the late 1200s, it's at least um, recognized widely by the king and by the nobles of Scotland. Um, there's also a project in Scotland to look at, at dedications of place names and dedications, um, gifts of money, and certainly Andrew is an important one that people give to give money to. Again, marking who has money, right? Um, but yeah, when we when we hear it's all Scots believe this, well, yeah, I mean it's it's Scots that are have money and have positions of power and authority that are um, uh, that are representing. Um, that view, but um, but nonetheless, it seems to be broadly across Scotland by the 1300s. Are the relics still there, and have you seen them? <laughs> Great question. Um, there is a parish, a Catholic parish church, that claims that they just still have the relics. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a clear lineage of how they got there. Um, it, and, and in fact, the, the, cult, uh, the, the cult around his relics kind of seems to die out by the end of the medieval period. Um, after, after his relics are um, captured from Constantinople, where they also have some of the relics, and brought to Italy, it seems that that kind of takes over as the main place where um, Andrew receives pilgrims. Um, and so it, it, the pilgrimage never really catches on to St. Andrews and the relics seem to just kind of disappear at some point, possibly during the Reformation period um, when covenanters ransacked all kinds of things that um, were related to the Catholic Church. But yeah, the, this, this um, I, I have been to that parish church that claims to have the relics, but it, it's hard to tell how accurate that is. Um, was the ambition to put St. Andrews on the map, did that predate Rome of Zen, or is he kind of the entrepreneur that really he's, made it happen? He's certainly you know, joining in with the bishops that preceded him in claiming the position of Bishop of Scots and trying to maintain and protect this independence from any, um, any, any English church. Um, but he takes it to a new level, uh, partly because of the, who he is. He's a networker. He's a politician. He, he manages to um, kind of make connections with lots of different people and then also bring in uh, you know, things from these bigger uh, centers in Europe, like Paris, to really try to, try to put it on the map, as you say. Do you have a sense of how long that connection between St. Andrews and, and Paris once was, you know, is important? And, uh, 
and what happened afterwards in terms of musical development in St. Andrews? Did it ever develop its own, or was it always sort of looking back to the, the mother church? Or yeah. Well, so in the back of this book, the, the same scribe, um, but writing slightly later, writes his own collection of some music that's probably around 1240s or so. Um, but there's nothing of evidence of music from St. Andrews beyond that, except for a few fragments that I've found, um, but it's hard to piece together a storyline from a fragment from probably around late 1300s and another fragment from around 1500. So um, it's hard to tell. Uh, there, there is some kind of um, 1500s music in Scotland, um, but it's hard to draw a line back to this. Um, and we don't have any account of this music being sung after this. So, yeah, it, it's hard to say. And in fact, it's possible that it was never sung at all in St. Andrews. It's possible that the scribe wrote this book for, for, for posterity to, to show us how important St. Andrews was. And look, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, and I, I was struck, actually it was fascinating, fascinating and extremely helpful hearing Kate's illumination of this process now, um, because it makes sense of some of the difficulty, um, or some of these particular, I don't mean difficulty, I mean the, some of the particular experience of trying to learn this music, which is, and you know there's that, there's that um, phrase that one who sings prays twice, and I, I suppose we've prayed many, many times to this. Um, because it, something about it defies, uh, defies um, reading and defies um, sticking. So it's sort of imp improvisatory. Actually, sorry, I didn't answer a question. I really asked a question, actually. That's why, so I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, but, but I, yeah, so that the experience, and I don't know what Lily thinks about that, but my experience is that it's like improvised, it feels like improvised music primarily. And then it does feel like, um, especially in the context, you gave kind of a liturgical context with your lecture, it really feels like participating in something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with that frisson of it being improvised. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that's sort of a comment and question about the improvisatory aspect. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly, the, the style originas, originates as improvisatory. And the question is, why does it get written down then? And, and actually, that's kind of an ongoing debate in scholarship. What's, What's the relationship between this written form and the actual practice of it? Because the written form happens much, kind of 50 years after we think the improvisatory version of it happened. Um, so why does it get written down? Well, uh, likely for people like the scribe in, in St. Andrews who wants this stuff for his own cathedral. Um, and in fact, you know, copies exactly certain passages in order to try to recreate exactly what those, those um, clergy in Paris are doing, but it still, yeah, maintains that that kind of slightly improvised, uncontained feeling to it. I agree. Well, thank you again.